All righty. Well, good morning again. Uh, I'll be teaching this morning. I'm Kevin McPhail, assistant pastor, if you don't know who I am. Um, if you would, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be in verses 1 through 14 today. And the title of my message is, What is Your Response? Uh, so again, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. As you turn there, i got a quick story to share with you guys, something that happened to us this week. As some of you know, uh, our sheds are on the back of the property. We needed to paint those. And uh, we're a little low on funds. We didn't have enough money. So what I decided to do was I took the bucket of paint that we had. I got a bunch of little buckets. And I got some water, and I thinned the paint out. So all day Thursday, all day Friday, uh, some of us went and we painted the sheds, and they looked beautiful. They looked awesome. Friday night, I don't know where you guys, if it did this where you were at, but it rained, and it rained hard here at the church. So all of our work that we did on those sheds was gone come Saturday morning. It was gone. So I prayed, <laughs> pretty discouraged, pretty bummed. Lord, what happened? Why, why did you allow that to happen after all that we did? We spent two whole days on that. And the Lord said to me very clearly, like thunder from the sky, repaint, repaint, and thin no more. <laughs> Just kidding. They're good. The sheds are painted. <laughs> and it did not rain, but I like that. Uh, one more. Big Fred seemed to always fall asleep during the Sunday sermon. His wife was fed up, so he decided, or she decided to deal with this embarrassing situation. The next Sunday when he fell asleep, she quietly, quietly removed some pungent Limburger cheese from a zip, Ziploc bag and passed it under his nose. Groggily startled, Big Fred blurted out for all the congregation to hear, No, Helen, no, don't kiss me now. <laughs> the end. Have a great Sunday, everybody. <laughs> All right, uh, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for really bad humor and uh, that it can make us laugh even still. But we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. I pray, Jesus, that you would, um, that you would speak through me to your people. Lord, we just, as we sang, we invite you here, we welcome you here. We continue to pray that right now. We, just, we welcome you here this morning, right now, as we study your word, Lord. We don't want to just sit here and read it and talk about it if you're not here, because then it's pointless. So I pray that you would be here, in, uh, you're here in us, be amongst us, Lord, and open our ears, open our eyes to what you have to say to us this morning. We want to take your word this morning. We want to apply it to our lives as we go out this week and go back to work, go back to our families, go back to our friends. I pray, Lord, that as we study your word, as your spirit speaks to us through your word, I pray, Lord, that we would allow you to transform our hearts, to transform our minds, and continue to conform us, to form us, to mold us into the men and women that you created us to be. So I pray that you would speak right now through me, Lord. Call my heart. Speak through me to your people. I pray that as it makes sense to me, I pray that it would make sense to your people this morning as well. Help me to, to relay your message correctly and clearly and concisely. We just thank you, Father, and we pray this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. Is it a little hot in here? Is it hot? Some of you are? I'm, I'm preaching on hell, so I figured we'd get it nice and warm and toasty. I'm just kidding. I'm not preaching on that. So it's kind of a mixed response, so I'll just let it slide, whatever's going on with the air. The, uh, is the bass, can you mute the bass? Is the bass muted? The amp is clicking up here. That will bug me while I teach. Just remember to turn it back on when you go to worship. Okay, now, finally, to the message. Uh, so here in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, we find ourselves in the last week of Jesus' life. This particular parable is about the wedding feast. Uh, it takes place about a day or two after Jesus has rode into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey while the people are shouting, Hosanna. We call this what? 
Palm Sunday. Yep, you guys can talk. It's okay. You guys can speak up. Uh, we call this Palm Sunday nowadays. I noticed something interesting as I was taking a look at this text. I've taught on this text previously uh, about five years ago. And so I brought it back up. I was looking at it again and decided, you know, I really enjoy teaching it. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it a second time. And, uh, but I noticed this time as I'm reading through kind of his last week here on earth before he was uh, betrayed, between the time that he arrived in Jerusalem and the time that he was betrayed, that in chapters 21 and 22, Jesus tells quite a few parables. And a reoccurring theme that I noticed was that Jesus was talking a lot about transformation. Now, if you just read it at face value, you see that he's really, his, really his main point is just that he has authority, that the Son has authority uh, from, given to him from the Father. But when you look at the people that are involved with it, that he's talking about through it, you see that they had a, a lack of transformation in their lives. You see in chapter 21, the parable of the two sons, where they're both told to do something. One says no, and then does it. One says yes, he will do it, but then doesn't do it. And Jesus says, who obeyed the Father in the end? Well, the one who said no, but then did it, I mean, the one who said yes, but did not do it, you see that there's a lack of transformation in his heart, in his life. He says the right things, but then he doesn't do the right things. The second son, he says, no, I'm not going to do it, but then you can read into it and see that there's a transformation that takes place where he realizes, you know what, I really need to do what my father tells me to do. And so his heart changes, and then he goes and does what he was originally asked to do. Then in the same chapter, we read about the parable of the farmers who were entrusted with a vineyard. And when the owner of the vineyard sent messengers, and eventually his own son, to collect on his share of the crop... They kill them. They beat them. They kill them. They kill one of the messengers. They kill the son. And they just refuse to give to the crop, to give to the vineyard owner what is due him. Uh, people like the blessings of a vineyard, but do not, or these people, they like the blessings of the vineyard, but they do not respect the vineyard owner. We go on and we read about the parable of the wedding feast, which we're going to take a closer look at today. And then in chapters 23 through 25, we see Jesus kind of focus or shift his focus to focusing on being ready for his return, for us as his people, to be ready for his return. When talking in Christian, to, with Christians in today's society, you can't help but see a lack of transformation in many of their lives. So many of us love salvation but we do not want to allow our lives to be completely transformed from what it was before we accepted Christ. We all know that the Bible tells us that when we accept Christ, we are born again, right? Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And Paul tells us that we are a new creation in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is true, but on our part, we like to just change out the old parts that we don't like for new parts in our life. You know, we keep saying, or we, uh, this could be anything from attitudes, relationships, physical activities, mental thoughts, whatever it is. It's like I heard one pastor say one time that we ask God to come into our hearts, to come into our house. We tell him, take a seat on the couch and go prepare your, or, or, I'm sorry, I said this wrong. It's like we have people come over to our house, not God. <laughs> We have people come over to our house and we say, go ahead, take a seat, you know, make yourself at home. We go into the kitchen, we go get some, uh, something to drink for them, we come back and they're gone. And we're like, what's going on, right? And so then you go and so you look into the bathroom, there's no, the door's open, there's no one there. You go in your bedroom and you find them, they're going through your closet. It's like, what are you doing? And then, you know, they're taking stuff out and you find that they have a, the, the trash can is full in your bedroom. You know, why you have a trash can in your bedroom, I don't know. But if you did, it's full. And you're like, what, is, what are you doing? You know, this is my privacy. This is my room. What do you think you're doing? And you said, make yourself at home. I was removing the stuff that I wouldn't want in my home. You know, this, I thought that's what you meant. You know, we don't really mean that. But we kind of do that with God. We say, okay, God, come into my life, come into my heart, make yourself at home. How many of you read the, the little story, My Heart, Christ's Home? Some of us have. I encourage you to read it. You can find it online for free. Just Google it, My Heart, Christ's Home download or something like that. And you can, there's, there's tons of versions out there. Or email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. I've got it in PDF file. But it talks about that, where Jesus comes in and he makes himself at home in our heart. But we don't really let him be at home. It's like, okay, come, make yourself at home, but just stay in this room. And that's all that you can really make home. And, and even when you're in there, don't really change anything around. Um, but thank you that I get to go to heaven and spend eternity with you. This is going to be awesome. Think of it this way. A caterpillar changes into a butterfly. 
right? Pastor Craig taught on this in his uh, Daniel study a few weeks ago. You know, you saw the little cartoon uh, caterpillar, you guys remember? You know, the little guy from uh, Bug Story. Oh, look at you, you all look like little ants from here. Um, <laughs> that sounded really weird. All right, so a butterfly is completely different from a caterpillar, right? Different diet, different mode of transportation, and looks completely different. When we come to know Christ, we are changed completely as well. We have a new spiritual diet, the Word of God. We go to different places than we did as a non-believer. Our entire manner changes to where people question whether we are still the same person. Now, how weird would it be if you saw a butterfly trying to walk like it did when it was a caterpillar? You'd be like, what's going on? Have you seen a butterfly uh, that didn't make the entire transformation? Have any of you ever seen that? Go ahead and put up the picture, the first picture. So there's a butterfly where its wing didn't fully develop. All right, so basically it died. <laughs> it couldn't fly, couldn't get around to eat. Uh, the next one. So there's one where both wings didn't, didn't fully develop, and he died as well. It died. And then the third one, there's a butterfly that didn't make the complete transformation. It still has the caterpillar butt <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the, the butterfly head. You know, and this is a real picture. This isn't Photoshop. This was from a, a butterfly website. I don't know there are so many of them out there, but there are. And so he didn't make the full transformation. And when you see something like that, it's wrong, right? That's not natural. It should not look like that. It should be totally different. You can put the pictures down. So what if the butterfly stopped eating nectar and started just munching on leaves again? It would die. It wouldn't last too long. What if you saw the butterfly trying to go back into the cocoon? We'd think the butterfly's crazy, you know? Well, what about us? We change. We become a new person. But a lot of times, we'll see ourselves trying to go back to our old ways. We're a new creation, but acting like the old one. And this is dangerous for us as Christians, as believers in Christ. It's dangerous for us to be at that place where we're a new creation, but yet we're still acting and doing the same things we did before with the old flesh, the old creation. And so that brings us to uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, starting in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So Jesus begins this section, this chapter, with answering something from the previous chapter. When you look at the previous chapter, no questions were asked of him. But what happened was the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're getting so fed up with Jesus, so mad at him. They were questioning him. They were trying to, they were coming up with trying to find some way to kill him, to get rid of him. But Jesus sensed their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. He knew what was in their hearts. And so he went on to explain to them, hey, you guys, you got this all wrong, you know. And this is what it's like. It's like a, a wedding feast. And he goes on to explain it to them. So in this parable, the king is God, the son is Jesus, and the bride is his church. Those first invited, as we're going to see, are the Jews. Those later invited are the Gentiles, the rest of all mankind. Paul talks about this in Romans 1.16, about the Jews first and the Gentiles. He says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jews first and also the Gentile. The Jews were not more worthy of salvation, but they had been chosen by God to be his example to the world, to display his love and his mercy to, as it was their race that the Messiah would come through, that his son would be born through. In this parable, the feast is the gospel, the message of salvation. He is inviting the Jews and then later the Gentiles to come and take part in the feast or gospel that God has prepared for us as a celebration of the coming marriage. When Jesus comes back and raptures his church up to be with him, then the bride is with him. And we enter into the ceremony, the bride, the church, entering into all eternity with their groom, with Jesus Christ. So this king has prepared a party for his son's wedding. At this time in history, wedding parties were such a huge deal. They would go on for seven days, you know, most of the time. So partying for a wedding was a really, really big deal. Uh, the betrothal period, kind of like the engagement period, um, usually took place many months before. 
But the marriage rite was consummated by bringing the bride to the home of the bridegroom. And the occasion was celebrated by a feast to which many are invited. So basically, the groom, the guy that wants to marry the girl, says, hey, I want to marry you. She goes, oh. And then uh, back then, it was, I think it was more like, okay, yes, sir. And so then they go, and the, the, hus- the groom, or the fiant, the man, goes and prepares the place, prepares, adds on to his father's house, uh, prepares a place of residence, and then comes back at some time, unknown time, and brings the bride back to the house where they have a party, and they celebrate, and then they enter into marriage with one another. So this first, in, uh, this first invitation was a notice of the coming party, because in tradition, they would send out two notices. They would send out one notice that says, hey, there's a party getting coming soon, uh, and you're invited. Then they would receive a second notice saying, hey, party's ready, come on this date and this time, and we're going to have fun. All right. So in this parable, the invitation is given to the Jews that we just read in verses 1 through 4. Uh, we read about this being given to them throughout the Old Testament, all the way to John the Baptist. What's strange in this parable is that these people refused to attend the celebration. Not just that it was a celebration, but it was a royal celebration. So in other words, this was going to be much bigger than the average Joe down the road. This was going to be great, amazing food, tons of people, the best music. It was going to be one of the best parties that they could ever attend. But yet these people said no. The wedding of a prince was to be a spectacular event, and an invitation would normally be prized. Yet these people refuse. It's an illustration of how there is no good reason of why God's good gifts are refused. And these are their reasons in verse 4. Or, sorry, verse 5. But we're going to read verse 4. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Verse 5, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. So we see a couple things here. The king wouldn't take no for an answer. He says, hey, you might have rejected the first invitation, but I really want you guys to be here. I really want you to come. So please, I'm sending out another invitation. Please come to the party. He even told them, you know, what the dinner was going to be. Isn't that human nature? Yeah. So what's going to be, what are we going to eat at this party? You know, should I come late? Should I grab McDonald's on the way and come late? You know, should I come early? Is it going to be great? But he goes, hey, it's going to be so great. Plus, look at the food we're going to have. You know, it's, it, you don't want to miss this. The king persisted in making the invitation as attractive as, as possible. And that's the gospel. God has done everything for us. He's prepared everything for us. All he's asking us to do is to respond to the invitation. To come. We don't have to bring anything. We don't have to pay to go. We don't have to you know, be a certain type of person in order to attend. The salvation is there for everyone. He's prepared it for us already. But these people refused, again, making light of something that was supposed to be a huge deal. They felt that their own lives and desires were more important than stopping what they were doing and responding to the invitation. So this second invitation, the group of people, that the messengers that were sent out, they represent the apostles and the other disciples who were violently rejected by the Jews after Jesus died and rose again. Verse 7, But when the king heard about it, he was furious, And he sent out his armies, and he destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This was fulfilled in the year 70 A.D. The Jews Jews rejected the prophets. Then they rejected God's son Jesus. And they rejected the apostles and the ministry of the early church. After the early Christians were basically driven out of Jerusalem due to uh, persecution, Uh, Jerusalem was lit on fire, and the temple was burned to the ground by Titus, who would soon become an emperor of Rome, and his army. Charles Spurgeon made this observation. I read this from David Guzik. The divine retribution that fell upon Jerusalem ought to convey a solemn warning to us. In these days when so many are making light of the gospel in our highly favored land, no nation ever yet refused the gospel without having some overwhelming judgment as the consequence of its daring criminality. May God prevent such awful calamity by His almighty grace. And that's something for us to take note of as well in light of our country's 
current situation. Verse 8 of Matthew 22. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both, uh, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. After about seven years of preaching the good news to the Jews, we read in Acts chapter 13, verse 46, that Paul and Barnabas turned to the Gentiles. This is what they said. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. You see, after the war that took place in 70 A.D., the Jewish-Roman War, the first one, the power in the early church, I was really interesting as I was reading up on this this weekend, but the power of the early church originally was with the Jews, the Jewish Christians, in Jerusalem. But then after the persecution took place in Jerusalem, many of the believers were scattered, and then once this war was coming, they knew the siege was coming from the Romans, the, the Christians, the Christian Jews, basically left, and they went to another city and kind of took refuge there. And so what we see after this judgment that took place was that the power of the early church went from Jewish Christian leaders, J Jewish Christian leaders to Gentile leaders. So we see that God started it with the Jews. The early church started with Jewish Christians. But then what happened was because the Jews as a whole, the, the, the non-Christian Jews, they continued to reject the Messiah, they continued to reject what Jesus was doing, what God was doing with his son through the early church. Then the power, then really the church shifted to mostly Gentiles. And that's pretty neat because you see that God's judgment is true, that it comes. When he says something's going to be done, it's going to be done. Now that doesn't mean that Jews can't be Christian because there's many Christian, Christians out there with Jewish heritage that are Jewish. But you'll see when you take a look at the church even today that majority of the church are Gentiles. They're not Jewish. So it's really interesting when you see that. Uh, Pastor Chuck Smith talked about it, that when he went to Jerusalem, they went to some, there was some guy's house. I don't know if you saw this, but he said that he went in and the guy had been excavating for years. And he had dug down through just centuries of earth, <laughs> of ground, and he saw layers and layers of different things. And you could see what happened throughout history. And all of a sudden you come to this layer of like, I think he said it was about 13 inches of just ash. And it was from 70 A.D., when the, Rome, when the Romans, when Titus led his army and just sacked Jerusalem, just burned it to the ground, tore apart the temple, took the gold, they believe gold was in between the bricks, tore apart the bricks for, for the gold, you know, all that stuff. And so Chuck Smith says it's really interesting to see it in person because you see, wow, God's judgment is right there. It's true. It happens. When he says something's going to happen, it happens. And so he, we see that his judgment, and this, from this parable, Jesus says it's going to happen, we see it take place. Verse 11 of Matthew 22. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. So this is where our study this morning goes from just history and information and trivia and stuff to pertaining to us and to our lives today. So the king comes to see all who have responded to this third calling. He, the messengers went out to the highways and the byways. Bring in everyone. Bring in all that you see. Invite them. They're all worthy. Bring them in. And the king comes to see all that who have come. Right? We see that he's brought the good. The good are there. Right? I'm here. I'm good. I'm the good one. Then we see the bad. You know, the rest of you guys here. So we see the good, we see the bad, and we see the ugly. Matthew is here, so. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. We love you, Matthew. Not ugly. Beautiful. He's a beautiful young man. All right. So, but my point is, there's a place for every one of us, right? There's a place for every one of us, no matter if we're good, if we're bad. And by the way, I don't think I'm good. I know I'm bad. But there's a place for all of us at this feast. And the king comes to see all who have responded to the invitation. On the coming day of judgment, the day that Jesus, our great and mighty king, 
He's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares, the bad fish from the good fish. He's going to inspect his church, for he's coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And so we see that take place here. The king comes to see those who have gathered. And amongst those who have gathered, he finds one man that is not wearing the proper attire. One man among many, and he found him right away. Nothing gets by our Father. He sees everything. Oh, we might try and get away with it while we're here on earth. We don't want our families or our friends knowing about the secret sin in our lives. We think we're good, but that's wrong. God sees it. In Hebrews 4.13, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom we are accountable. If you have sin in your life, you don't want it exposed, you don't want to tell... Guys, we have to deal with it with God because God sees it. I think Pastor Craig, he said, I think he said that last week. He already knows it. Why are we trying to hide it, right? Get right with God. Put an end to that sin in your life. Do what it takes to get rid of it. He allows you and I to walk in that sin while we're here on earth. He doesn't force us to get rid of it or to get out of it. But he allows us to while we're here on earth so that we'll have a chance before that day of judgment to repent. It's, it's God's sovereignty. He allows you to have that sin in your life. He hates it. He doesn't want it there. But he's allowing it because he's wanting you to finally get sick of it one day, to surrender it to him, and to be right with him. Because on that day, whether it's when he comes back or it's when we're taken out of this life, on that day, it's going to be too late to repent for the sin in our life. You read about that in Matthew chapter 7 near the end. But just because we might, quote-unquote, get away with it here on earth, does not mean that God is allowing us to get away with it in the end. Back to this man in the parable with the wrong dress. What happens to this man who came with the wrong clothes? We're going to read that he was bound and cast into outer darkness. Now why is it such a big deal about this guy, about what he was wearing? Back in this time, wedding garments, if you're even moderately wealthy, you would provide wedding garments to the people coming to your wedding, to the ceremony. And the reason for this was because they wanted all the attention to be on the bride. So all the people coming to the, to the party, to the wedding ceremony, we would, like, say there's a couple getting married, we would all wear the same robe, the same dress, the same attire. You know, so that way, we all look the same, but there's one person that is standing out above all, and that's the bride. All prettied up all her jewelry, looking the most beautiful that she's ever wanted to look. She finally gets to do that. And so that way, all the attention is on the bride. Uh, If you think about our traditional wedding services today, you'll kind of notice the same thing. The bride is all prettied up, with her bright white dress and beautiful hair all done up, and usually a lot more makeup than they normally wear. And the bride really turns heads at a wedding service. Literally, when she walks in, everyone turns around and watches her walk in. The groom dresses in a white shirt and a black suit. There's a simple explanation for this given by a wise father to his son. A father and his son were attending a wedding when the son suddenly asked the question, Dad, why is the bride wearing white? Because this is the happiest day of her life, son, and she wants everyone to know it. So then why does the groom wear black? The son asks. Some of you will get that later. But really... The husband is attending a funeral of his flesh. He begins that day to lay his life down for his bride. So back to this parable and how it applies to us. I'd like to show you two areas where this man messed up. First, he responded to the invitation, but he was disobedient in his response. This man responded to the invitation like all of us who have responded to the invitation given to us for salvation. But after responding to the call, this man did not conform to the king's expectations. He came to the wedding feast, but he came how he wanted to be dressed. He refused the robes that were to be provided. said, no, I'm good. I'm just going to wear what I'm going to wear and just enjoy my time here. He came on his own terms. He thought his own robes were righteous enough. So why accept the king's provision? Well, let's read what the scripture says about robes that our king supplies us. In Isaiah 61, verse 10, you can write it down. It says that, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful 
in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He supplies us with the robes of righteousness. Ezekiel also talked about clothing from God, and he says this in Ezekiel 16, verses 10 through 14. I gave you expensive clothing of fine linen and silk, beautifully embroidered, and sandals made of fine goatskin leather. I gave you lovely jewelry, bracelets, beautiful necklaces, a ring for your nose, earrings for your ears, and a lovely crown for your head. Verse 13, and, you so, and so you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were made of fine linen and were beautifully embroidered. You ate the finest foods, choice flour, honey, and olive oil, and became more beautiful than ever. You looked like a queen, and so you were. Your fame soon spread throughout the world because of your beauty. I dressed you in my splendor and perfected your beauty, says the Sovereign Lord. That's the clothing that God gives His people. That's the clothing that God provides to you and I. When He clothes you and I in His righteousness, that's what He sees. Does that make sense to you guys? When He clothes us, and that takes place when we come and we respond to His invitation, we accept His gift of salvation, He then clothes us in amazing clothing in His eyes. He looks at us as a beautiful bride. Peter talked about clothing ourselves with beauty from within, the Holy Spirit, rather than focusing on the outward appearances as well. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. He talks about that. He says, don't focus on the outward, basically, but focus on the, let, let your beauty come from what's within, the Holy Spirit. Let God make you beautiful. Let God affect how you look and how you dress and how you act. This man, though, thought his own robes and his own garments were good enough. But Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, 6, that our righteousness, when we wear our own clothes, thinking that we're righteous enough, we don't need God's, you know, his clothing, we don't need to be changed by him, we don't need to wear uh, his provision. Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. For those of you who are kind of new to Christianity, that means used women's products. If you don't know what that means, you can ask Pastor Craig after the service. But this man came to the wedding without wearing the supplied garments. He responded to the calling. He came to partake in the great feast, and he came how he wanted to. He had, by his actions, if not in words, said, Sure, I'll come, but I'm not going to change anything about myself. I don't want to change. I just want the goodies. I want the benefits. I want to have fun. This man, did, uh, this man who did as he pleased at the wedding feast, instead of honoring the king and conforming to his expectations, suffered a terrible fate. The king found him out, even though this man was able to fool those around him. The king found him, and he cast him out into outer darkness. Again, Charles Spurgeon said this, He came because he was invited, but he came only in appearance. The banquet was intended to honor the king's son, but this, meant that, but this man meant nothing of the kind. He was willing to eat the good things set before him, but in his heart there was no love, either for the king or his well-beloved son." Which leads me to point two. The second problem with this man is that he had a heart issue. So he came, but he came disobediently. But the reason he came disobediently was because really he had a heart issue. As you read through the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus is way more concerned about the condition of your heart spiritually than he is about really anything else. Because it's what's in our hearts that cause us to act out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? When we just read this parable and not look into its meaning, it seems pretty strange that the king would come and say, hey, you're dressed wrong, what's wrong with you? Get him out of here, cast him into outer darkness. But as we've seen, it's a lot more, it's more than just about looks. It's not like the king said, hey, I don't like how you look, get out of here. He saw right to the heart of the matter. He saw the real issue that was taking place in this man's heart. He didn't simply wear the wrong clothes, but he rejected the robes that the king provided, the robes of righteousness. The king's clothes or robes aren't necessary to attend church, right? For us today, we don't, they're not necessary to attend church, but they're necessary to enter into eternity in heaven with God. So we see that this man's heart wasn't right with the king. I believe, uh, through studying this passage, that he came just to receive the benefits of the party, 
not to celebrate with the king. He came to eat and drink and participate in the activities, but he didn't come to honor the king. And we know this because he rejected the robes. So what does this mean for you and I? What is your response when God calls you to salvation? As he's called you and I, what has our response been? Do we come to God and say, thank you for salvation? Thank you for saving me from hell? I got a nice get out of hell free card. But then we don't change. We don't transform. We stay that kind of half butterfly, half caterpillar, really ugly looking creature. Or do we say, Lord, my life is yours. Use me. Transform me. There is an old youth group song that we used to sing. Take my heart and form it. My mind transform it. My will conform it. Do we allow God to change us? Or are we just using God as a good luck charm? (laughs) Do we just use Jesus as like our Buddha? You know, I learned that from Pastor Craig, being in youth group with him. Do we just use him as like we rub, some people rub Buddha's belly? We kind of treat Jesus like that. Oh, I love salvation. I love all the benefits, but I don't want to change. And so then when, when disaster comes or trials come, hard times come, all of a sudden, who do we run to? Oh, God, please, 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 please. And then he takes care of it. We see him work mightily. And then what do we do? Thanks, God. See you later. And we go back to doing everything that we did before. I heard it said once that God is not just a God of emergency. (laughs) He's a God of everyday life. Not a God, but the God. He's the God of everyday life. He's for everyday situations. Like I said, we come to Him, but when transformation is brought up, we say, no thanks. Laying down my rights, picking up your cross, no way, that's for pastors only. Sacrifice, persecution, nope, I'm American. Doesn't come with the package. But let's face it. We use God a lot more than we realize. We come to the feast too for free food and fun. But notice what the king called this man. Knowing his heart, knowing what was happening, he calls him friend. Friend, why are you here? Why are you not dress in the right clothing. Friend, why did you reject my provision for you? But does a friend come to the party and disrespect the host? Not a true friend. I heard one person say this, that there are many false friends of God in the church today. Many people in the church seem right to us. They seem like they are a friend of God. But God really knows the truth. The king was the one who noticed that this man was dressed wrong. Not the people. Maybe they noticed, but they didn't say anything at the party. The king is the one that came out. He saw it, and he addressed it. We won't always know what's going on in someone's life, but God does. He knows what's going on in their life. But most importantly, as I said near the beginning, he knows what's going on in your life. Are you here this morning pretending to be a friend of God? He's your friend because you just don't want to go to hell. Or are you a friend of his because you understand that he loves you and that he died for you, that he gave his life to you so that you don't have to remain the person that you were, the person that was always getting into situations of of bad, the person that was always laden with guilt and shame who is depressed, who is discouraged. He saved you from that. We don't think about that a lot of times. Not all the time, but we don't think about it a lot of times. We just think, hey, I don't have to go to hell. Hey, God's good. Hey, I should get everything that I want. Some, some theology out there says I should get whatever I want, whenever I want, because God loves me. But in your heart, only you and God truly know Are you transformed? Are you letting God transform you? Are you wearing His robes of righteousness? Or are you wearing your own robes? Are you trying to walk the Christian walk in your own way, how you think it should be done? The Greek word, I thought this was interesting, in verse 12, uh, for the word not, is different from the word used in verse 11. The Greek for not in verse 12 has to do with a mental decision. In verse 11, we see that he is not wearing his robes. And you just see it's like it's, just, it's not happening. But in verse 12, the king is asking, literally, why did you decide 
Why did you choose, why did you make a choice to reject my provision? He had a choice. He could have taken it, he could have not, he chose not to. It was the mental attitude. It was the heart, what was in his heart, that caused the man to reject the robes. His heart was not right, and that is what matters to our king. Are we responding to the invitation because of our love for our king? Do we want to be a part of his party because we respect him and we're appreciative of what he has done for us? Or are we just responding to the invitation for the benefits? We come, but we don't allow God to change us. Verse 13 of Matthew 22. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. The king took this man's action serious and had him removed from the party. Not because of his clothing, but because of his heart. Because he chose to reject the provision of the king. This man took his calling lightly. He took the invitation lightly. God does not take things lightly. This man thought he was all that and that it didn't matter It only mattered that he was there. But God says different. It's not about what you and I think. If you think you're good enough, that that doesn't matter. You think you're, you're living the Christian life good enough, that doesn't matter. What matters is what God says about it. What does God say about your life? What does God say about what you're doing, what you're allowing, what you have on TV at home, what you have on your Netflix account, what you have uh, on Hulu, what, you know, the TV shows and movies that you watch. What's on your phone? What's in your search history on your phone, on your computers, on your tablets, on your laptops? YouTube accounts. God knows what's in there, guys. And if we are doing this Christian life saying, hey, I can have all this junk and I'm fine, I'm free, I'm good, and we think that God is happy with us, this parable explains otherwise. So if you're coming to me, the king says, in your own righteousness, you're here. That's great, but that's not what's important. Did you accept my provision? Are you being transformed? Are you letting me change your life? Are you giving up the things from the old life? Obadiah chapter 1 verse 4, it says this, Though you ascend as high as the eagle, he's talking to, uh, I think it's uh, Judah at the time, but he says, Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, From there I will bring you down, says the Lord. So we might think so highly of ourselves. We think, I'm good, God loves me, I'm chosen. You know, whatever it is that we tell ourselves in Christianity. But we've got all this other junk in our life. God's going to humble you and I. He's going to say, friend, why are you doing this? You might think you're good in your own eyes, but that's not what matters. I will bring you down. Not to make you pay. Not like I'm going to bring you down. But because you need to be humbled. So that you fully understand my gift of salvation. And that you truly accept my gift of salvation. Because this man's heart was not right, he was rejected. He was rejected by the king. Cast into outer darkness. And that's where the dangerous part comes in for you and I as Christians. It is important that we take the things of God serious. As we've seen that this parable demonstrates that those who are indifferent, the first invitation, they ignored the invitation. They're indifferent to the gospel. Those who are antagonistic, they killed the messengers the second time the invitation was given out. They killed them. They beat them. And then there's those that are unchanged. The man who rejected the king's provision. All of those affect the area of the gospel. They're indifferent to the gospel. They're antagonistic against the gospel to the gospel, and they're unchanged by the gospel. All three categories, they all share the same fate. Either they're not allowed in the party, or they're removed from the party. None of them got to enjoy the king's feast. Many are called to salvation. In fact, all are called to salvation. But few are chosen because they choose not to accept God's provision. As one man said, And Pastor Craig has quoted it many times. We'll be surprised who is in heaven and who is not in heaven. When you look at the parable of the soils, there's four soils. Only one soil 
responds to the gospel the way that we're supposed to. Only a quarter of those that hear the word of God based on that parable are going to respond. And you see that this parable of the wedding feast, so many more were invited, but only a small percentage of those that were invited actually came. Matthew Henry, who was an old uh, theologian, said this about this parable. Of the many that are called to the wedding feast, if you set aside all those as unchosen that make light of it and avowedly prefer other things before it, if then you set aside all that make a profession of religion, but the temper of whose spirits and tenor of whose conversation are a constant contradiction to it, if you set aside all the profane and all the hypocritical, you will find that they are few, very few that are chosen. Many called to the wedding feast, but few chosen to the uh, sorry, but few chosen to the wedding garment, that is, to salvation by sanctification of the Spirit. This is the straight gate and narrow way which few find. This man like us, who thought he could do it his own way, came to the king how he chose to, found that his own way was not accepted. Many of us think we have it down right, even though God is speaking to us through our friends, our family, our pastors, And if we don't realize this here now, in this lifetime, we too will realize it when we go before the king. And he tells us, be gone from me, I never knew you. And we'll join those who ate and drank with the Lord. It's interesting, if at another time you read Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 27, it talks about those who ate with Jesus, they drank with Jesus, they they fellowshiped with him, they hung out with him, they did great things with him. They prophesied in his name. They healed and preached in his name. But then it says that they're cast into the outer darkness. You also read about that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. They're rejected from the kingdom. So this morning, I ask you, what has been your response to the king's invitation? What has your response been to God's gift of salvation? Whose clothes are you wearing? Have you been wearing your, old, your own clothes? Not allowing the king to change you? Are you the butterfly still trying to look like a caterpillar? Today is the day to allow God to transform you from your former self. And to begin walking in his clothing. We don't want to do it our own way. So let's accept the Lord's robes and clothe ourselves daily in his righteousness. A few verses about that. Romans 13 11 through 14 says, This is all the more urgent for you, na- for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. If he was saying that then, how much more true is it now? Right? There in the last days, we were in like the last seconds, a lot of people say. Verse 12 of Romans 13, The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Verse 13, Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Verse 14, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Okay, I'm almost done, Lord. (laughs) Pastor Chuck Smith said this. There are some who are trying to come without the proper clothing, There are some who have not put on that righteousness through faith of Christ, but are trying to come in their own righteousness, or by their own efforts, or by their own good works. They'll never make it. When the king examines, if you are not clothed in that robe of righteousness through the faith of Christ, you will be cast out. But that's just a plain, straight warning of the Lord. So what do we do? What do we do? We hear all this. Okay, Kevin, what's your point? You're not dead yet. You have to let God transform you. You have time to respond the right way to the invitation. And God is saying to you and I today to do that. He's calling you to respond. He's calling you to allow Him to remove 
that shame that Morgan prophesied about during the worship today. I'm going to just turn this off. Hello. All right. I'm almost done. But the Lord is saying to us this morning, let me change your life. Put away the deeds of the old self. Put on my righteousness. I provided it for you. I've given it to you. All you have to do is put it on. Adorn the Lord Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in his way. Walk in his spirit. And in Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual armor of God, 6, chapter 6, put that on. Read it on your own time. So if you this morning, if you leave with anything other than, wow, Kevin's kind of weird. If you leave with anything other than that, leave with the fact that God loves you. He died for you. He sent his one and only son to die for you so that you could be a new creation in him that you don't have to sin any longer. You don't have to walk in sin. You can choose to live for Christ and you can allow him to transform you. You don't have to, all you have to do is surrender to him. And that's what he's calling us to do. He's calling for a church to surrender to him and to allow him to change us from the inside out. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning. And I thank you for Just what you're speaking to us this morning. I pray that we would take what you have said to us this morning, that we would take your words to us and we would allow them to sink deep down within our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would be a people. We would be men and women that are transformed completely by your spirit. We're not holding on to the old areas of life. We're not holding on to the the old flesh. We're not taking our flesh down from the cross like it talks about, I believe, in Romans. But we're leaving our flesh on that cross. We're allowing you to transform us and to change us. And we're putting away the evil deeds and the evil desires from our flesh. I pray, Lord, that we would allow you to do that this morning. For anyone here this morning that has realized that, wow, that's me. I say I'm a Christian, but I don't live the way I'm supposed to. I'm doing things my own way. I pray, Lord, that that you would be ministering to their hearts right now. And if that's you this morning, it's very simple. We as humans like to make it complicated, but it's not. It's simple. You just simply pray, Lord, I'm sorry, and I repent. I choose to no longer do this, and I surrender my heart and my life and my mind to you, God. Every area of it, I surrender to you, and I choose to put on your clothing this morning to put on your righteousness and to walk in your righteousness. So Lord, I pray that we would all choose that this morning and this week that we would walk it out by cleaning out our browsers, cleaning out our our social media accounts, cleaning out the stuff, cleaning out anything that's just got junk of this world in it and putting you on in every area of our life. I pray this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen.